I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today we'll be talking with journalist Christine Keneally about the history of tragic abuse in religious orphanages. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Our guest today wrote an article called We Saw Nuns Kill Children. Abuse in religious orphanages is our topic today, and we'll be speaking with award-winning journalist and author, Christine Keneally. She has a PhD in linguistics from Cambridge University. She's written for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Slate, Time, Scientific American, and other publications. Her books include The Invisible History of the Human Race, How DNA and History Shape Our Identities and Our Futures, one of The New York Times' 100 notable books that year. Christine Keneally was a senior contributor at BuzzFeed News for four years, and her 2018 BuzzFeed story about American orphanages, titled We Saw Nuns Kill Children, The Ghosts of St. Joseph's Catholic Orphanage, was viewed more than six million times in six months. It became the basis for her newest book, just out earlier this year, called Ghosts of the Orphanage, a story of mysterious deaths, a conspiracy of silence, and a search for justice. And we are speaking with Christine Keneally from her home in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to Free Thought Matters, and thanks for getting up so early. <laughs> You're welcome, Dan and Annie Laurie. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. So what an amazing book. I enjoyed, I guess enjoy is the right word to describe a book that has such grim topic. But I enjoyed reading all of the data. And you put a lot of work into the research. You must have traveled a lot. You did a lot of reading, interviews, searching for victims and for perpetrators and lawyers and looking for corroboration. How did you become interested in such a topic, the abuse of orphanages? Yes, it, it, it was not something that I knew about in really in any way or form before uh, a little over 10 years ago now. And uh, what had happened was that I'd gone to a conference in Brisbane, Australia. It was a conference run by archivists. I'm really interested in information about how we track information, how we corroborate information. And it went into a session that I'd not heard about before where archivists were talking about individuals who had grown up in 20th century orphanages and who had very little access to critical basic information about their lives, information like what their real name was, whether they'd had siblings, who their parents were. And it was just extraordinary to me that these people who were by then in their 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s were forced really to live in this state as adults where they just were disconnected from these networks of pieces of knowledge that we all have about ourselves. And the archivist presented it, you know, very much as a human rights issue, which it clearly was. And sort of from that place, I, I became intrigued at how this had come to be. I did not understand how you could reach that stage of life and not know these really fundamental things about yourself. And it was clearly such a painful place for these individuals to be in. So I started to track them down. I spoke to more. Every time I spoke to someone, the stories they told me were more and more extraordinary. And that really was the beginning of a very long, winding road through a very strange world. So you realized very early on that there was huge abuse going on 
there was huge abuse going on. The first man I spoke to, the first person that I met who had been in one of these orphanages was this beautiful man called Jeff Meyer. He'd grown up in a place in Sydney, and he told me about physical abuse that I'd experienced. And the abuse ranged from what we would think of as standard, incredibly unpleasant and horrible, but still standard corporal punishment for the 40s and the 50s, children being sort of whacked and hit and sometimes hit with objects, to just completely unhinged examples of adult rage being perpetrated and acted out on children, children being thrown downstairs, children being held out windows. It's really, it's still hard, even as I say it now, having been in this world for so long, to to really, um, you know, there's that saying, you know, that you can be sort of surprised but not shocked. I'm still surprised sometimes when I talk about this. So the physical abuse was terrible. Jeff told me about it. The emotional abuse was equally awful for these little children who had been ripped away from their families, who were in these strange institutions, who didn't know anyone there, didn't often didn't know why they were there, were often told that they were there because they were bad. And then nuns or priests or other individuals would say to them things like, you are society's garbage, which literally tell them that they were waste. Um, and then, of course, there was a the sexual abuse as well. Jeff had been sexually abused. Many of the people that I met had also been sexually abused. And the sexual abuse was pervasive, and it was clearly networked. There were clearly individuals who went from these places, went from one to the other when the situation got a bit too hot. So it's just this absolute nether world of abuse and exploitation and dehumanization of children. The title of your article was, We Saw Nuns Kill Children. Is that a direct quote from one of your sources? No, it's not a direct quote, but it's, it's certainly a very close paraphrase of a lot of conversations that I had. And what had actually happened, Jeff himself, the very first person I spoke to, mentioned children going missing in very strange circumstances. Even for that world, Jeff was often locked in a cupboard under the stairs. Um, children like Jeff were left in situations like that for more than a day or two at a time in really extreme cases. But Jeff recalled being locked under the stairs with children. And then on a number of occasions, the door under the cupboard stairs being opened up, but it was the middle of the night out there. And Jeff remembered this specifically because he told me about the experience of being eventually pulled out of the cupboard during the daytime and having been in there for so long. And I'm sure you remember this experience as kids. The sun hurt his eyes because it was so bright when he, this little child, had been in the dark for hours and hours. So there were a number of occasions where it was dark outside. It was clearly the middle of the night. The door opened, no one spoke, and someone reached in and grabbed one of the kids that he was with, and then they were gone, and he never saw them again. That happened numerous times. At the time that Jeff told me, you know, I, I took it in. I believed Jeff. I believed what he was telling me about the sexual abuse. I believed what he was telling me about the physical abuse. We all know enough now, post the Spotlight investigation, the 2002 Boston Globe investigation, to understand the kinds of things that went on in these places. But I took Jeff's death story and I just kind of mentally shelved it. It was just, it was a little too much for me. And it didn't feel tractable as an investigator. I didn't feel like something I really knew what I could do with. But as time went on, I spoke to more and more individuals. And, you know, in amongst these very casual stories about daily life in the orphanages or what they did as an adult, they would also then say, you know, when I saw a child die, I saw a child disappear. And eventually it dawned upon me that if I believed even half of the stories about physical abuse, you know, and in conversations with people who would grab my hand and place it upon scars on their body, scars that they still bore from their treatment. If I believed even half of those stories, it made no sense to just discount the death stories. They warranted investigation, even after all that time. So uh, tell us more about St. Joseph's Orphanage there, the, the yeah. focus of your first uh, article in, in BuzzFeed in Vermont. That's right, yes. Yeah, St. Joseph's was opened in the late 19th century. It closed around the 1970s. The lifespan of the institution very much tracks what many institutions of the same kind were like in states in, everywhere in the United States. And I ended up looking at St. Joseph's because in the 1990s, a group of individuals had come together to try to sue the church. One man called Joey Barquin came forward and he contacted a lawyer after, in fact, he contacted 
priests at the diocese. He wanted to first negotiate with them and see if he could get some kind of acknowledgement and justice. They stonewalled him, as you know, anyone who's dealt with the Catholic Church in this kind of situation would be familiar with. He then contacted a lawyer and slowly over the next few years, his story just grew and grew and other individuals came forward. This also happened across the world. I just, I, I really want to say that in the 1990s, there was this sort of coming to consciousness for many individuals who'd been in orphanages in Australia, in Scotland, England, Ireland, in the continent. But in the United States in particular, where their efforts ended up, where the activism ended up was in litigation, which, as you know, is an incredibly stressful, incredibly costly and really combative process and a very combative process for individuals who are already carrying so much trauma in their lives, who are already struggling with the fact that they're not believed by most of the people that they speak to. That litigation occurred. It was really traumatizing. It was ultimately for its own purposes a failure. No one won. Uh, there was some small amounts paid by the church to individuals who had been there. But what had happened in this process, because all these brave individuals had come forward and had told their story, was they generated a huge amount of documentation. And so that was 20 years before I came along, started poking around, but I was able to find the traces of it. In that period of time, you know, it had become quite dispersed. I had to get it from different institutions and piece pages back together, almost like a puzzle. Eventually, I came across some videotapes of the depositions, and it was incredibly powerful to be able to watch people who'd been at St. Joseph's tell their story and to match the stories across the depositions and to understand there were cases where people were telling the exact same story from a slightly different viewpoint. It was quite clear that what they said had happened had in fact happened. Well, then your story that came out, you must be proud of the fact that it prompted some more investigations and maybe made some changes in the laws. Is that what happened? It had an enormous impact and it was it was beyond anything that I'd hoped for, but it was absolutely the minimum that justice required for the people who had been through this experience. So the state attorney general of Vermont, then T.J. Donovan, launched a criminal investigation as a result of the 2018 BuzzFeed News article. It was a multi-agency investigation, and basically it meant that the state, which had for so long ignored the stories and the situation of these people, actually sat down with them, listened to them, gave them a compassionate and a friendly um, engagement and, you know, ultimately said, we believe you. After two years, the state published a 200-page report, which also means now that the stories of people who've been at St. Joseph's are in the historic record of the state of Vermont. They cannot be disappeared again in the way that they had been before. The state also supported a restorative justice process, which meant that survivors came together. Some individuals who had organized and uh, we met each other in the 1990s and then dispersed in the wake of the litigation, came together again 20 years later. Individuals came forward who had actually never even told their story before, and they worked together to affect all sorts of change. And two of the biggest consequences of their activism was that, first of all, the sexual um, the statute of limitations for sexual abuse of children in the state of Vermont was retroactively repealed, which means that anyone who had experienced sexual abuse as a child was now able to come forward, no matter how long ago it had occurred, to tell their story. They could not be ruled out and not listened to simply because it had happened a long time before. But even more dramatically was that the, the statute of limitations for the physical abuse of children was also retroactively appealed. That's the first time that's happened in the United States. Wow. And elsewhere in the country, it's very hard for people as adults to say that things had happened to them as children, to have experienced physical abuse, and to get any kind of justice. So Vermont has very much led the way in this regard. So you probably have worked with Marcy Hamilton a little bit or interviewed her. I've absolutely interviewed Marcy Hamilton. She's an incredible figure. And she's very, very much led the charge on the repeal of sexual abuse limitations across the country. And as Marcy will tell you, that has happened in a number of states. Um, it's happened to different degrees. Vermont's is the, one of the most complete, where there's a retroactive appeal. Um, in other states, there's a temporary stay, in a sense, of limitations. Um, but because of the good work of Marcy Hamilton and her organization, that fight is very much still underway. Now, briefly, could you tell us who these children were, why they were placed in the orphanage? Because they weren't always orphans, were they? 
Almost never. There are almost never orphans. In all of the cases that I uh, read about in Vermont, in all of the families, with all the families that I spoke to, there was only one where there was one girl who was an orphan. Generally, they were the children of poverty. And for some reason, in some way, one of their parents, maybe both of the parents were incapacitated, were perhaps unfit, were themselves ill or addicted or in jail. Um, in some cases, it was just because a child was born out of wedlock and a mother was either forced or persuaded to give that child up, and the child was taken into the orphanage. Yet I understand some of these children were told their parents were dead or never wanted to see them, which is so cruel. It's so cruel. It, it's hard to believe how cruel it is. But children were absolutely told that. We're told, Or they were told that their parents were evil. They were told that their parents were shameful, and they were told they were going to grow up to be like them. So they, from the very beginning, were just this sense of hopelessness and futility about who they were and who they could be in this world was shaped in this very cruel way by these nuns. Now, we do have to take a break, but I do have to say you write about horrific abuse and violence in your book, children thrown from windows, an orphanage with an electric chair, medical experimentation on children, and it just sounds like a horror story. And when we come back, we want to ask you how widespread this abuse was and more about um, I guess some of the predators who hung out at these orphanages. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening. But the religious pushback is fierce, and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan. Lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace. Let's restore respect for America's secular roots. Help the Freedom From Religion Foundation defend the wall of separation between state and church. Join us at FFRF.org. Freedom depends on freethinkers. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with award-winning journalist Christine Keneally, author of the riveting expose, Ghosts of the Orphanage, a story of mysterious deaths, a conspiracy of silence, and a search for justice. So, Christine, in your book, you put the spotlight, if I can use that word, you put the spotlight on St. Joseph's in Vermont, but it's, it's a wide-ranging problem, wasn't it? It wasn't just here in the United States. You went to, where, Ireland and what other countries? Yeah, it was absolutely wide-ranging. It was across the world, and really, in many ways, it was everywhere the Catholic Church went. So, you know, very much in the United States and in Canada as well, in Australia, England, Ireland, Scotland, I spoke to people who had been in Irish residential schools, which is what they were called, but they're effectively the same kind of institution. I spoke to people who had grown up in orphanages on the continent, in Europe, um, in Germany and other places like that. I spoke to Native Americans as well. There's sort of two tiers of the, this world in the United States, people whose families grew up on reservations, but who were taken from their families, sent to uh, mission schools run by the Catholic Church. Likewise, in Australia, kids in urban settings were taken into these orphanages, but indigenous kids from Australian Aboriginal families were also often taken away from their families, placed in these missions that were run by the church, basically the same kind of organization, very similar things happened to them there as well. Yeah, it happened here in Wisconsin to the Chippewa, for example. Yeah. So you write that according to the church's own records, male predators largely filled the upper tiers of the St. Joseph's organizational structure. 
How, how could this be allowed to happen? Yes, it's, it's, it's in some ways an unanswerable question, Annie Laurie, but you know, what I discovered was that going through the depositions of the 1990s, um, just very much priests who had themselves been at the orphanage were, uh, were deposed and they denied that anything had happened at all. Of course, they denied that sexual and physical abuse had occurred, but they suggested that, you know, the children were to blame, that the individuals who were coming forward in the 1990s were malcontents in some way or disturbed in some way or were somehow wrong for trying to tell these stories. They spoke about the nuns as these generous, charitable, wonderful creatures who had given their lives to look after these kids. That was an experience I had reading those depositions for a couple of years. And then I came across some documents that had actually been released by the church in 2006, released only because the church had been forced in another case to release them by a judge. Um, those documents had been floating around for a while. And I had reached out to a lawyer who'd been involved in that litigation and almost incidentally, he said, well, look, I don't really know anything about the orphanage, but these documents might interest you. He hadn't really gone through them, looking at them for information about the orphanage at all. And what I found in that just blew me away. You know, priests who had themselves been deposed in the 1990s had, according to these documents that had been in the church's secret archives for a very long time, I had just a year or two before been sent to rehab, rehab, as we know, being institutions where priests whose activities in assaulting or molesting or in some way interfering with children and, and critically that that had become somehow known. So the priest needed to be removed, not necessarily that the priest had been perpetrating damage upon these little kids, but that the scandal was about to erupt. So, you know, I'll never forget Father Foster, who had spoken with such a sense of pious judgment and sort of mild outrage that these people would come forward in the 90s, tell these stories as if they were somehow making them up. He himself had abused many children at the orphanage. And individuals contacted me who hadn't been at the orphanage, but who had grown up in Vermont, who had themselves been abused by this man. And he was just one of the individual chaplains who'd been in charge of the orphanage between the 40s and the 70s. Wow. And we don't want to let the nuns off the hook. I mean, you, you write about the fact that they just weren't schooled or prepared in any way to take care of children, many of them. No, that's right. So inside these institutions, and this is very true pretty much all over the world, there's often one priest who was the, you know, the ruler, the mini king, and there were layers of nuns beneath them, 10, 20, 30. At times at St. Joseph's, there were 30 nuns. They ranged in degrees of experience, but they themselves were often kids who came from families. They were the ninth or 10th child of you know, a farm family in Quebec, and they had been given to the church to become a nun. Many of them hadn't finished their high school education, or in some cases, very close to just having only elementary school education. So they were absorbed into this institution where, as we know, charity is one of the guiding principles, but of course, obedience is also one of the guiding principles of being a nun. So this little mini army of women around these institutions um, obeyed the priest very much, obeyed the, the dictate that, you know, scandal was the most important thing, that, that there'd never be any scandal. And they covered up anything that came to light, but also many of them perpetrated terrible physical abuse and sometimes sexual abuse on these children as well. You write that um, these organizations, these orphanages, actually were a great source of income to the church because the charity that look at the look at the wonderful charity that the church is doing. So they use those buildings and those things to raise money for the church, didn't they? That's absolutely right. And there were a number of ways in which these institutions made money for the church. The institutions themselves ran at um, on a shoestring. You know, the children often had food that was near rotting. Um, sometimes they had great food. I, it certainly wasn't always the case, but the children themselves, um, you know, wore sort of hand-me-down clothes. They were very hard to run. But the church ran a charity drive every single year to raise money for all of the church's works. And as one of the priests admitted in the 1990s depositions, the orphanage was their, their flagship 
institution that, you know, they would place articles about it in the newspaper every year when they were running their charity drive because when people read about, you know, these poor little kids who didn't have parents who were being looked after by the lovely nuns, they donated money. I also found the records of many individuals who left their estates to the Sisters of Providence who had run the orphanage because of the orphanage. They thought that they were doing such extraordinary work. They left them houses, real estate, other forms of assets, which they were then able to sell. Now, can we reassure ourselves that this is all in the past, that this is all over? Well, we cannot. So the orphanage themselves closed in the 1970s. But one of the most important parts of this story is this basic understanding that because we haven't had a reckoning, because we have in no way really absorbed the lessons of what happened and being honest and accepted what happened then, we must ask ourselves, you know, where the lessons went. So so that's all been hidden. There have been very few people who've had any kind of reckoning. So the foster system, which was sort of born and emerged initially somewhat in parallel with these institutions and it eventually took over, the foster system, you know, has many of its own issues as well. And that they're not being addressed with the rigor and the level of scrutiny that they should be because people simply haven't accepted the kinds of things that can go on in these situations. It's also the case that in the United States, and I've been contacted by many young people who just in the last 10 to 20 years were sent to training camps were sent to schools by their parents, the disciplinary schools, kids who were sort of acting out, get taken away by these privately run companies, which offer to sort of set kids straight and take them out into nature and, you know, essentially isolate them, much as the orphanages did from their families and the rest of society. And terrible abuses go on in these places as well. Well, thank you, Christine, for such a gripping and useful book and, and great calling attention to it so it cannot happen yeah. again. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. It's great to talk to you. The book is called Ghosts of the Orphanage. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.